those nations are under as long as they control those nations. And that explains things like World War I and World War II, where you had, you know, essentially fascists versus communists and, and uh, some freedom-loving people on the sidelines. And the Cold War, which uh, you know, went on for such a long time, but the end result of it was an America that was less free. You know, we uh, were, were priding ourselves on the fact that we broke the back of international communism uh, under the Reagan administration, but the, the end result back 30 or 40 years is that we now live in a less free country, and in, in a lot of ways, a country that's a lot more like the Soviet Union used to be uh, now than what we had back in the 19th. We have more central planning. We have less individual freedom. When you come right down to it, we are at the cusp of a probably what will probably uh, – it'll probably be a, a third world war is what it's going to be called in retrospect. And the exactly how the nations will line up for that war is difficult to say. And we have this huge wild card that's been created by the internationalists themselves, which is radical Islam. They want to have radical Islam as a foil, as the, the new um, enemy du jour, and they want to use that as the pretext for forming global power structures, uh, global armies global currencies, and global uh, media, and global control. To them, again, the bottom line is not what system gets put in place, but who controls that system. That's right. You can see the beauty, and I want you to continue on this eloquent uh, breakdown. The, the, just like the Rothschilds 300 years ago would fund both sides of European war, or three or four sides, then they just jump to the winner at the end and then dictate the terms to the defeated, just like World War II, British intelligence and others had a secret peace treaty with Hitler. That's been declassified. They basically encouraged him to invade uh, Czechoslovakia and Poland and Danzig and all these other places. I'm not saying Hitler was good. He was totally played. And then he had a treaty to attack the Soviets and they would stop or attack the Russians. And then they double-crossed him there on just so many fronts. And you sit back and you realize, oh, my gosh. The elite running us in World War II was more evil and sophisticated than Hitler. And that's a hard group to beat that could actually play the Germans. And you just sit back in awe and you see them radicalizing Islam, turning it loose, giving them the weapons, letting them overthrow our allies, secular governments, uh, taking over. It just goes on and on and on. And then you see the ultimate enemy is free will. It is Western Christianity. It is the Renaissance. And you understand, when they set up the Soviets, then we had to build up to fight them. But that was the globalists building up arms and a culture and a police state they again would control to then use against the people. You see how sophisticated it is. How do you get the public to even tune into that reality to understand that at the end of this endgame, there is mass population reduction, world government, the end of religious freedom, forced inoculation. I mean, and now we're so close to it. Now in Europe, they're arresting you if you don't want to have a thousand Islamicists in your town of a thousand. If you say it's wrong, I don't want to pay for it, they come and the Stasi arrests you. The Stasi. I mean, it's so naked. Go ahead. Sorry. That's quite I'm, I have to agree with you. And uh, you were asking, how, how do we wake people up? The, the method I chose was to write novels, because a lot of people will not sit down and read a treatise on globalism or treatise on economics, but they will read a novel. And I, it, starting first with my Patriot series, which was about socioeconomic collapse here in the United States, and now with my new series of novels that um, it's, a, it's going to be at least a five-book series called The, the Counter-Caliphate Chronicles, I'm exposing what they have planned to do in 
instituting a semi-successful Islamic caliphate, my goal is to wake people up, to get people thinking, and to basically shift their paradigm so that they can they can see through this nonsense that's being fed to them on the nightly news, and they can reestablish critical thinking skills. That's what's really needed here. We need an educated electorate. We need uh, statesmen instead of politicians, and we need people to stand up for their God-given rights and constitutional liberty. We need to reestablish a constitutional republic, and we need to defeat the globalists in detail, and en masse. Well, I would hear you, and I respected you. I've been interviewing you off and on for about 15, 16 years. First read one of your books 20 years ago, where you actually put real militia leaders and stuff, you know, in in the book. And then I finally interviewed you, and you said, no, I'm, I'm kind of writing what I think may happen in the future, but putting it in a popular novel form so it actually reaches millions. And you've had some number one New York Times bestsellers. Uh, but to now go back and read some of your books, which I've done, it makes me physically nauseous. I can't even read them because I do see uh, how accurate you were. I'll be honest, I hear Glenn Beck, who's been wrong on a bunch of stuff, six years ago say there's a plan to launch a new caliphate. Uh, I would hear, uh, you know, things like that. And, and I would think to myself... This is overblown. They'd never actually bring in giant Islamic armies and let them start attacking to fully bring stuff down. But now I see there's a billion and a half Muslims. They first successfully infiltrate them, take them over, put the most radical in charge, give them weapons, turn them loose, and let them take over large areas. And then what areas they don't let them take over, they'll use the attacks to take us over in the name of protecting us. They'll kill a bunch of cops with White House run groups. The cops will then militarize. They'll then aim them at me. I mean, you can really see it. This is sick. So, so as I was saying, James, in the past, because I heard you talking about this 15 years ago, plans for these Islamic armies and the rest of it, I knew they'd wound up al-Qaeda for 9-11. That's now come out in the news. But to a great extent, it looks like under this whole world government system, they plan to give Islam a huge seat at the table and make everyone adopt a one-world religion where we can't have Christianity we actually adopt a one-world religion that's partially Islamic and that that's how the politically correct use it. They say, we've got to be tolerant of whatever the most aggressive, intolerant group is. Or you can't have a boys and girls bathroom. That hurts somebody else because this radical minority says they're a transvestite. I now see the paradigm of where they're going, and they know how politically correct and pathetic we are now. So they'll bring in a bunch of radical Muslims to bully us with government backing, and they believe we're so broke back, we will bow to them and worship them. So uh, how do we not go down that road, and how did you see it coming so far away? Well, I, to get back to your, your first part of your question, if, if you look at the way the internationalists and globalists operate, they always think in terms of multiple gains. They never do anything unless they're going to get more than one win out of the situation. And in the case of backing international Islam, they, what they want to do is two things. They want to have a, a worthwhile opponent that they can expend massive quantities of money on in the, in the form of military armaments and military deployment and so forth. And they want to also draw a parallel between Islamic fundamentalism and Christian fundamentalism. They want to make us look like two heads of the same coin so that in their war on Islam, they can have a simultaneous war on Christendom. That's right. They pass laws saying, be nice, be open, where you now lose your basic right in the process. Yep, that's, that's their goal. And I think that if you look at what's gone on uh, in the events leading up to 9-11 and, and, of course, everything that's happened since 9-11, it's all played into this kind of master plan of both building up international Islam and putting fundamental Christianity in the same breath as fundamental Islam. That's their goal. 
And they've played it very masterfully. And of course, they have the mass media as unwitting dupes in all of this. And if you look at what, what's been poured out of Hollywood, what comes out of Madison Avenue, and what comes out of the, 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 the halls of power uh, inside the Beltway in D.C., it, it all fits together. And unfortunately, the folks that end up paying are the people, are, are soldiers deployed overseas who end up paying in blood, and the American people who are, who are paying in the form of overtaxation and the diminishment of our individual liberty. Who, you always have to ask yourself, who benefits? Qui bono? James Wesley Rawls is here, just piercing insight. He can take five minutes of my babbling and in 30 seconds crystallize it down. But that's exactly what's happening is a war on religious freedom by importing the most radical and tolerant groups uh, who they've also used to take over the Middle East and basically then bring in laws restricting all of our speech in a foil to, quote, suppress their more radical instincts, but also exempting them to be radical, but no one else can be, quote, radical. And if you expand on that, some of the good news I see, and I want to get James Wesley Rawls' take on this, is the military a couple years ago said no to backing a bombing of Assad in Syria for al-Qaeda. And we saw a lot of non-commissioned officers and officers hold up signs and go to Twitter and Facebook saying, I will not be the Air Force for al-Qaeda. I will not fight on the ground to kill Christians in Syria. They clearly saw that Assad didn't start the war. He didn't do anything. He's, right. he's, a, he's a good guy compared to al-Qaeda. He's certainly not perfect. And that the West is destabilizing the whole region. We've already seen it in Egypt, Libya. So people understood it. Now we have the former head of defense intelligence coming out a month ago and saying, we were ordered to back al-Qaeda in Syria. It was a conscious decision. And the reporter said, so Obama didn't know what he was doing. No, we were ordered. They knew exactly. We told them what they were doing. Now we have the former deputy head of the CIA coming out saying there needs to be an investigation. It appears they were ordered to cover up that we knew we were aiding al-Qaeda, which is really ISIS. So I was here every day. You were there talking about it. But now uh, U.S. training helped mold top Islamic State military commander. Uh, that's in McClatchy today. Uh, I'm, they'll probably get a Pulitzer Prize for it. We told you four years ago. Uh, House Dems want 9-11 docs in Saudi Arabia declassified. President Obama orders behavioral experiments on American public with the CIA domestically. See, this is, it's all, that's daily caller. See, it's all getting really weird now where CIA is operating domestically. And, you know, I'll be walking down the street and they'll have guys that are obviously military in plain clothes going, you ought to work with us, Alex. I mean, it's getting really weird uh, how they're, have their soft intimidation going, how they're messing with people. But at the same time, the military people who, who aren't openly evil, who don't want to be bad, who know there's always been some corruption, but understand they were lied to. You don't dance with the devil, and then he changes, you change. When we come back, I want to get into the good things that are happening, and what do you think about the situation where openly backing Islam, radical Islam, to go around and murder everybody, our own military saying no. Is there some breaking point where the spirit of sanity could wake up and we could say no to this divide and conquer strategy we'll be back with james wesley rawls we'll open the phones up for our guests some of the next hour we'll tell you more about his new novel that's coming out as well and we'll tell you about some of the other big guests coming up we're going to be broadcasting for another 20 plus hours live the toll free number to join us on this 28 hour worldwide broadcast is 800-259-9231 I'm your host, Alex Jones. We're going to be premiering three different documentaries we produced. They're really powerful. Uh, one on the Vatican and how it's been blackmailed and taken over. One on the Clintons uh, with one of their big insiders. It's really the new Clinton Chronicles 2015 is what I'm describing it as. Extremely powerful. All that and more premiering uh, in the next uh, 25, 26 hours we have left in this worldwide transmission. We're going all the way to 3 o'clock Central tomorrow. So the 28-hour broadcast uh, is up and running. The biggest thing you can do is to send the free link at infowars.com forward slash show or the free link at infowars.com forward slash moneybomb to Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, all the different platforms. When we send you an email, if you sign up at the InfoWars newsletter for the free email alerts, videos, and stuff like that, 
We'll send you a link uh, to it as 